Good evening. This is um, my Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, Jesus has donned to the um, tomb of Lazarus. He got a message four days earlier that Lazarus was at the point of death. Uh, he waited two days. Lazarus died the day that Jesus got the message and he waited two more days and then he takes basically two days to get there. So there's four days um, on purpose because um, previously Jesus had raised a couple people from the dead and it had only been a couple hours since they were dead. And the Jews at that time had a belief that the body kind of hung around, the spirit hung around the body, not the body hung around. The body better just keep still. But the spirit hung around the body for maybe three days. Um, and so he waited till the fourth day so they would know for sure he was dead so that when he did this miracle, that there would be no doubt um, that Jesus had raised someone from the dead, right? That makes sense. Uh, probably because during that time, somebody that they thought was dead, turns out they wasn't, they weren't. So they waited at least three days. Okay, there's been no pulse for three days. So this person's dead, 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 dead. Jesus waited till the fourth day. Um, just checking something here. So, um, I'm going to begin with uh, Jesus. She, he's, she, he's just spoken to Martha, and we're going to review what he said to Martha. He's about to speak to Mary. And then some very interesting things are here in the text that we have to deal with. Uh-oh. Oh, okay. I think. Oh, that's me. That's me on my phone. Okay. Yes, I'm just making sure that um, that uh, everything was working. Okay. So in Gen uh, in John chapter ten, chapter eleven. Um, let me change that to an eleven. Verse twenty. One. Now Martha says to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know whatever you ask of God, God will give you. I know for sure that Martha did not, when she says, whatever you ask, she didn't think he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. It had been four days. So that's not what she was asking for. She was asking for comfort. She was asking uh, for some blessing for their family. Um... I know this because when Jesus later says, roll the tomb away, she says, it's been four days. He's stink like, why would you roll the stone away? His st the smell is going to come out and hit us. She's not thinking he's going to walk, her brother's going to walk out of there. So she says, when she says, whatever you ask, she, that's not what she was asking for. But Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And she says, yes, I know in the last day, in the resurrection, at the last day, yes, he'll rise again. So she says, I am the resurrection and the life. And it's important to know that there are a lot of things we are putting off. By and by, after a while, when we get to heaven, these things will be taken care of. And we have to know that Jesus can take care of them right now. That there are certain things we're just thinking, well, yes, you know, once I get a new body, then finally this arthritis will be gone. Well, maybe God, Jesus is like, I am the resurrection. I'm the living resurrection. Right now, everything that's promised in the resurrection, I'm here right now. I can, and the, and the Bible says we have an earnest, we have a down payment now of all the stuff that's going to be, we can have. So healing, all there's plenty of stuff that we can ask the Lord for now. Um, he, and he might give it, he, he may not. But Jesus is saying, I am the current resurrection. So you might be surprised what you can get right now. He believes in me, though he were... Though he may die, he'll live. <clears throat> He's letting her know two things. Let's be clear about how you feel about the resurrection. That's me. I'm going to be there on resurrection day. So you've got to know that I am the guy who will be representing you. 
People here have to have faith in me. I'm not just some prophet. The resurrection all revolves around me. It's all about me. So, uh, he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Maybe even today, but certainly in the resurrection. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. So if you're alive when I come back, then you'll never see that. Do you believe that? Yes, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who's coming to the world. So I'm good. So that's where we ended last week. It says, when she had said these things, oh, good. When she had said these things, uh, thanks, Tammy, and all those who wrote something, so I know that, okay, it is live, I'm not crazy. When she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary her sister. Why did she have to do it secretly? The, the Jews who were there visiting, some of them hated Jesus. They had just tried to kill him earlier, a few months earlier. That's why he went up to Galilee. He's been in Galilee for a couple months. He's back down now. There's just a month or so left of his ministry. Not much time left. But some of the Jews who were there are the very rich Jews, the Sadducees who were contributing money to the temple and had tried to kill Jesus, Jesus because he was threatening to them. Um, so I, she doesn't want to say, hey, Jesus is here, because who knows what they might do. So it says, she comes secretly saying, the teacher has come and is calling for you. Now, as soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and went to him. The problem was, everybody was there mourning with her. She has a bunch of people mourning with her. So if he just gets up and leaves, everybody's going to go, what's happening? Which is exactly what happened. It says, that, it says, now Jesus had not yet come into the town. So he's still kind of a, a, a football field away from where their house was. Um, so their house was not at the grave site. They didn't bury, they buried him in the mountains. They buried, had buried uh, Lazarus in the mountains near their house. So Jesus was closer to where Lazarus was buried as opposed to close to the house. Um, I just wanna get a picture, this will come, this will be very important in a few minutes. There's a mountain range called Mount Moriah where Garden of Gethsemane was, where Calvary was, Golgotha, that hill, and Bethany was on the other side of that mountain. It is a day's journey, less than a day's journey, 45 minute walk from there to Jerusalem. Um, so they, Bethany, they lived on the same mountain range where, where there were a lot of tombs and things. In fact, Jesus was buried in that same mountain range that they lived in. It's not a huge, tall mountain range, but those, those hills outside of Jerusalem. So Bethany is there. That will come, that will be important later. Um, so people, so Jesus is not at their house in the city of Bethany. He is outside near the tombs. So it says, now Jesus is not yet coming to the town, but was in the place where Martha met him you know, a football field away from the house. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, they followed her saying, oh, she's going to the tomb to weep there. They don't know Jesus is there, but they see her getting up. Okay, she must be going to the tomb. So they all get up and follow her because they were there to comfort her. So her thinking, oh, I'll just get out unnoticed and go see Jesus did not work. They all follow her out, her out there. Jesus hadn't told Martha, now don't tell anybody, that was just Martha's choice because she had heard what they were saying about Jesus. And if they knew he was here, who knows what they'll do. So that was just Martha's choice to tell Mary quietly. Mary just gets up, doesn't say anything, runs out to see Jesus. They all follow her. It says, then Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him. She fell down at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Same thing Martha had said. So clearly the two of them had said this to each other. You know, if only Jesus had made it. He didn't make it. I know he, he didn't. Now, he never really had a chance to make it because the day he got the message is the day that Lazarus was dead. But they knew as sick as Lazarus was, even if Jesus had just said in a word, he could have sent his word and healed him. Um, but, but they know if he was, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died because you would have, you know, raised him up from that deathbed. So, um, it says Jesus, therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her 
weeping. Now, I want to say the Jews who came with her who were weeping were supposed to be there. Jesus is not mad at them. Because what he did next, I read a lot of Bible commentators, right? I, every single verse I read, there's like six, at least six to eight different commentators I read in every single verse. I just want to see, what do they have to say? What do they say? Because there could be stuff I'm missing. So these people have studied for years and years and years. I want to know. They all say Jesus is mad at those people. And that's why what happened next happened. But listen, here in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 17, it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider and call for the mourning women, that they may come, and send for the skillful wailing women, that they may come. So, so there are people who that was like their gift. They were good at crying and weeping when it was time to cry. They helped you cry. They would cry, you know, because sometimes we don't know how to react. and we, So they're crying, 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 whew, and they help you release. So it's call for them. Let them make haste and take up a wailing for us that our eyes may run with tears and our eyelids gush with water. Now, there was a specific sort of repentance that, they, that Jeremiah wanted to go on. So call for these women who that's their gift, have them come. Normally they just show up at funerals, but we want them to come now because we all need to be crying in repentance. But what they were doing was not something bad. It was a function in Jerusalem. So it says Jesus looked at her weeping. He's not mad at her because she's weeping. And he looked at the Jews who were weeping. I don't believe he's mad at them. They're doing what they're supposed to do. They're at a funeral and they're crying. But here's what he did. It says, and he groaned. Now, the King James translated it groaned. Literally, it means he snorted like a horse would snort. But it means that he vehemently, he made this noise like, oh, oh like he was angry. It, uh, it says vehement agitation. So he, he didn't just go, oh, he went, oh, like he was angry. And that's why they think, well, he must have been angry at the people who were weeping. But I, that doesn't make any sense. They're supposed to be there. Why is he mad at them? Um, here's a couple other times when the same word is used. And you'll see when they use this type, and it's only like used four times, this specific word. She's only four times in the New Testament. So here's, here's where they show up. Uh, in Mark chapter 1, um, it says, Verse 40 says, now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I'm willing, be clean. So he's not mad at the guy. As soon as he had spoken, though, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And then it says, and he strictly warned him. Now it's that same wording that that they use for groan it's when you do something angrily he angrily warned him it said to be angry to be indignant now he's warning him and sent him away at once and said to him see that you say nothing to anyone but go your way show yourself to the priest and offer your cleansing uh, offer for your cleansing those things which moses commanded as a testimony to them so he's angrily warning him that that word now they translated to groan well we'll see why in a second but he suddenly went, ah, oh, and it, it, that means to say something because you're angry. So they translated, he strictly warned him. He's warning him, don't you dare. So he says, do not tell anybody. He says, however, he went out, they're talking about the, the leper, and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city. He told, every, Jesus says, please don't tell anybody what I've done. He went out and tells everybody. And so there's such a crowd now that Jesus couldn't go back to, uh, and this is a city outside of Capernaum. He couldn't go back to that city anymore. But was outside in desert places, and they came to him from every direction. So he'd have to stay outside the city because he couldn't even fit in the city. He could no longer minister to the city. And there were a lot of people who needed help. Jesus, a lot of people that Jesus was trying to preach to. But he can't get to them because this man went, and did the opposite of what Jesus said. That's why he was angrily warning him, strictly warning him with angry vehement, vehemently. Now, did Jesus always do this? When somebody, this is a, no, he only does this twice. There's, a, there, there's another time in Mark, uh, this is, that was Mark chapter one, Mark chapter five, just a few chapters later, 
It says, uh, Jesus went across the, uh, the Sea of Galilee to the Gadarenes and where the tribe of Gad had settled. And the man is possessed with all the demons in him, you know, a legion of demons, which is what Gad means. It means a legion or a troop. Of, and, and he says, I've got a legion of demons in me. And Jesus heals him. It says uh, in verse 16, it says, and those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon possessed and about the swine. Because remember that he cast the demons, the demons said, send us into the swine. So he sends them into the pigs. And then the pigs all run off the cliff and kill themselves. And uh, because the demons are like, whatever's in me, I can't take it. Uh, the man was like, ooh, I'm liking these demons, uh, until he didn't anymore. But the, so, the, so the people were upset because we're going to have to go in the ocean and fish those pigs out. And, and you're making our life really terrible, Jesus. They were going to kill these pigs anyway. It's not like, oh, no, the pigs are dead. It's like, oh, no, we got to go into the ocean to get the pigs. So then they begin to plead with him to depart from their region. Like, you got to get out of here, Jesus, because you can't keep sending pigs into the ocean. So it says, and when he got into the boat, he's like, okay, I'm out. He who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. Like, please, I want to go with you. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends. Tell them what great things the Lord has done for you. Go spread this to everybody. Now, this is on the other side of the Jordan where Jesus was going to send his disciples about five years from that time period. His disciples were going to go to the side of the Jordan and start preaching to those people. These people are the Gentiles. These are not the Jews. These are the Gentiles. That's where all, the, all these pigs were. That's where the tribe of Gad settled on the Gentile side. And um, this man starts spreading the word. By the time that the dis disciples get there, five years from the crucifixion, they're already primed and ready to hear the word of God because they've heard about this guy who came and healed this demon possessed man. So Jesus is like, those people, yes, go tell them because no one's going to be there for five years. It's not a problem. But to this leper man, please don't tell. I still want to minister in this area. And if you tell everybody that I healed you, they'll be so excited about the healing and the leprosy. I won't be able to minister. But the guy doesn't listen to him. Uh, in Matthew chapter 9. Again, this is what, using this word, he groaned, which means he angrily snarled and snorted like he was mad at somebody. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 27, when Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him. Now, now he's out. That first one was outside of Capernaum, city outside of Capernaum. This is inside Capernaum. And Capernaum is in the area of Galilee. It's in northern Israel. There's northern Israel, central Israel, where the woman of Samaria was. And then there's southern Israel where Jerusalem is. Okay, so he's up north. They love him up there. They, he's, his disciples are all from that area. Peter lived up in that area. It says, when Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. Now, I want to tell you, Jesus ignored them at first, because it says, and when he'd come into his house, the blind men came to him. So the blind men followed Jesus. He said nothing to them. He just kept walking. He went into the house. Because he wanted to heal them inside the house. That's why Jesus, he, he didn't say, follow me in the house. He just kept walking. He went in the house. The blind men go into the house. Whose house were they at? They're at Peter's house because Peter lived in Capernaum. Jesus said to them, do you believe that I'm able to do this? And they said to him, yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, according to your faith, let it be to you. So this is a big deal to heal somebody with leprosy. They'd never seen a leper heal since Miriam back in Moses' day. No leper had ever been healed, and that was 1,200 years earlier. They'd never seen a leper healed, and they'd never seen a blind person healed. So, according to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus, King James says, sternly warned them. But it's that same word, growled at them, groaned at them, rah! And, it, and uh, it's a, charged them with vehement threats, is, is what the, the, you know, when you go to the lexicon. Like he's threatening them. That's what that means. That word groaned. That Jesus did. He saw them weeping, saw them weeping. Then he, he is fiercely vehement for some reason, suddenly, right? So he's yelling at these people, at the blind men, see that no one knows this. And he's saying it vehemently in a threatening way. But when they had departed, they spread the news about him in all that country. So Jesus was having all this trouble ministering up north because people weren't listening to him, but he's, he warns them in a way that's vehement and, and angry. And that's normally what you're doing when you're doing 
because again, this word only appears four times. So I gave you uh, two of them. One is there at at the he he groaned at the Lazarus site, and here's the only other time where they use this word to show how somebody says it really angrily. Uh, in Mark chapter 14, verse 5. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, he sat at the table. A woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and he poured it over his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves. So they're mad. Why has, was this fragrant oil washed? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they groaned. Now, the King James says they criticized her sharply. They yelled at her. So they're yelling at her. This, is, this time, Jesus is not the one doing the yelling. They criticized her sharply. They're angry. They can't, Hurrah! Right? And, and so this is when this word is used. Jesus, but usually it's aimed at someone. It just says that Jesus, grrr! And so the commentators are assuming, well, he must be doing that at Mary and the people who are crying. But why is he mad at them? They're doing what they're supposed to do. So people try, like, who's he groaning at? Well, the very next words say, in the spirit. He groaned in the spirit. The writer of John, John wants to know he's growing in the spirit. He's not doing that at somebody. He's growing, in fact, later it says he groaned in himself. And because he's not doing that at someone, he's groaning in the, he suddenly is, uh, and he's feeling this thing inside and he's making these noises, and they don't know, like, where are these noises coming from? So he says he's doing it in the spirit. Now, there's another time where he uses a phrase like this, like Jesus did something in the spirit. He, he, he's at, uh, and I'm fascinated by this, and I want us to just spend some time here. Uh, so he, he's, he's, he's at, the very, at the Last Supper, what we call the Last Supper, and he's passing out food, right? And everybody's there eating, and Judas is there, and everybody's there. In John chapter 13, verse 17, it says, I do not speak concerning all of you. This is John chapter 13, verse 17. He says, I do not speak concerning all of you, meaning what I'm about to say is not about all of you. I do not speak concerning all of you. So don't take this the wrong way. I'm about to say something. This is not about all of you. He says, I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. That he who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. There's a scripture that says, he who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. So I know there's someone here that I've chosen, and God had me choose him, because he's the fulfillment of the scripture. That he who eats bread with me is lifting up his heel against me. But this is not about all of you, but there's somebody here, I'm just letting you know. He says, now I tell you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am. Now, the, the King James added, I am he. He's not there. They just think we're going to be lost unless they add words in. But we know, Jesus is saying, I want you to know that I am. Meaning, I already know what's going to happen. I know what happened in the past. I, when, Jesus, when God reveals himself as the great I am, he's saying, in every time period I exist. I'm not he who will come. I'm not he who was here. I just am at all times. So nothing surprises me. Because I always have been existing, and I, 5,000 years from now, I am there too. 5,000 years ago, I am there. I just am always. So things surprise you, they don't surprise me. So he says, I am telling you this in advance, so when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am. Oh, wow, Jesus already knew this was going to happen, so we're not going to panic about it. That's the point. Jesus is not bragging like, man, he's good. He knew about this. I'm telling you this in advance so that when it happens, you go, oh, this is not a bad thing. Jesus already knew about this. God already knew about this, you know. And, and he's, I'm telling you this in advance so you don't, so you personally don't panic when these things happen. And that same word for us. If, if God, if we know that God knew this in advance, we don't panic when this flat tire happens or when the, this happens or that. Like, okay, there'll be money to fix this. Or, okay. The, you know, God's going to heal. God knew about this. We just remind ourselves, God knew about this. God knew about this. God knew about this. So I'm not going to freak out. So he, that's what he's telling his disciples. Now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you believe that I am he. Now I'll keep going. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whoever I've sinned receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. So he's saying, I'm going to send you out. 
and whoever receives you, you're receiving me, whoever receives, you know, so when this all happens, when I get betrayed and then you go out and tell people about it, tell it in a way so that they all know Jesus, this was not some betrayal. This is not some defeat. This is the victory. Jesus dying on the cross is the victory. Jesus, God, Satan didn't win nothing. Satan's stupid that he let that happen because that's the victory. It's like, oh no, don't send me to the cross. Don't throw me in the briar patch because then I'm going to just save the world. And Jesus, devil's like, ah, he got crucified on the cross. Got him. And Jesus is like, you're really stupid, devil. And he is. Like, why are we scared of the devil? He doesn't, devil does not know. Devil's like trying to read the Bible, trying to figure out what's going to happen next. So, but God knows it all, right? So I'm telling you this in advance so you know what I mean. Now, then, when Jesus had said these things, this is verse 21 in John chapter 13, he was troubled in spirit. So that's that same phrase, in spirit. Meaning he wasn't mad at us. He wasn't mad. Something troubled. On the, suddenly on the inside, they could see, oh man, something is going on. And you, could, you see that with people. Like, uh-oh, something's going on with that person. Something, I can see it, you know. They're getting a message from God or something's, or they just suddenly feel something. He was troubled in spirit, he said. And then he said, and he testified and said, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about, who's he talking about? Jesus already said, I'm not talking about all of you, but they all still got confused. Is it me? Is it me? <laughs> so he was troubled in spirit means suddenly he, like he was getting the message from God. He's, he's communicating to God and he suddenly changes his tone and just says, one of you is going to betray me. So that's the spirit is communicating. Oh, I'm just getting something right. So when it says he groaned, which means he was vehemently angry, which normally should have been at a person, he says he groaned in the spirit. Now, is he mad at the spirit of God? What's going on? Like, why is he? Because again, the, this phrase is used four times, three times it's always you're yelling at somebody. Same phrase, but he's saying he's doing it in the spirit. Who's he yelling at? Who's he, what's that for? Who's it for? Is it, he's doing it in the spirit. He's talking to God. Why is he talking to, this, to God in this way right outside Lazarus' tomb? What's going on inside Jesus? Okay. John chapter 13. Oh, no, I already read that. Troubled in the spirit. Okay. Now, John chapter 11, I'm saying not chapter 13. John chapter 11, verse 33 still. It says, so he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And again, this is the King James people trying to make it make sense. But if they just leave it alone and translate it literally, it would make more sense. So he, he groaned, he yelled in the spirit, and it literally means troubled himself. But they don't know what that means. The translator is like, what does it mean he troubled himself? Literally agitated himself. It's like, oh, uh, like he was like this continued for a little bit and it whatever this this agitation he's feeling this anger that he's feeling this uh force he's like he's forcefully yelling at somebody this went on for a little bit that's why he he troubled himself he's like Ur. you know you might see somebody talking to themselves you know they're talking they're not talking to you they're walking down the street you know we'll, we'll see like a maybe they're pushing a shopping cart and they're little you know, challenge, they have a challenge in their head, and they're talking blah, 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 to themselves. We know that's they're in their own world. Jesus was in his own world for a second. He's groaning. He's Something's going on in the spirit. He's troubling himself. This is going on. He's, he's troubling himself. Um, the, again, the second time in the chapter where you hear the same word about groaning is John chapter 11, verse 38. It says, then Jesus again groaning in himself so the first time he says he groaned in spirit and troubled himself the just a few verses down he said jesus again groaning in himself so they want to make clear to everybody this was not about anybody around them he wasn't yelling at somebody he's like having a conversation within himself something's going on some something is going on in himself right where he's uh, like you know and so they commented on it twice uh Young's literal translation says, Jesus, therefore, when he saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, did groan in the spirit and troubled himself. Right. The, the, the King James says and was troubled. But the literal translation is troubled him, troubled himself. They just since he didn't know what it mean. Well, let's not translate it that way because we don't know what that means. 
just translate it literally, and God will give us the uh, understanding of it. Now, groaning in the spirit. Groaning in the spirit. Where else in the Bible does this come up? In Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 22. says, for we know that the whole creation groans. Romans chapter 8 talks about the three groans. There are three different groans that they mention. We know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now, like creation. So the reason we know this is because uh, the world was created beautiful by God. God said, and that's good, and I created this, and that's good, and I created that, and that's good. And then a curse was put on the land when... Adam's sin. It says in previously that it was subject, subjected to futility when Adam sinned earlier in the chapter. So Adam was put in charge of the earth, and when he sinned, the person who was supposed to care for the earth and keep it wonderful was disconnected with God. And so the earth is like decaying. Now, now where, where was this beautiful garden, and now it's going to experience droughts and famines and tornadoes and hurricanes. And, and because of the disconnection between, he says, you're going to struggle, Adam. You're going to have to work the land now in order to get things to grow and stuff. Where before, you just walked around and there was apples and figs everywhere. It's going to take work. You're going to have to struggle because of your disconnection from God. And, and, but there's coming a new earth, a new heaven and a new earth. So in Romans, Paul's saying, we know that the whole creation is groaning. And laboring with birth pangs, like it's waiting for that, like a woman in labor waiting to give birth to the new earth together until now. So he's saying when you see these earthquakes happen, volcanoes, that's the earth like groaning and creaking and, you know, like waiting to split apart so it could reveal this new earth. Uh, he says not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the spirit, like we're going to get our new body, right? So we have the, he's giving us the first fruits of it. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Like, oh man, I can't wait till I get this new body because, oh, these back pains I'm feeling, these knee pains, all these pains, ah, we're like groaning, you know, but he's saying we're groaning because we're going to get our new body. So we're groaning because this old body's falling apart, but we're going to get a new one. Now, in verse 26 of Romans chapter 8, because remember I told you there were three groans. Creation is groaning every time it shakes and our bodies are groaning. Arr. He says, likewise, the spirit in verse 26 also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. So this is a spiritual type groaning because this is not talking about the physical groaning. There are situations going on in the world just spiritually that are happening. And we don't we, we sense them and we don't know what we should pray. It doesn't say we don't know how to pray. We pray to Jesus, the Father God in the name of Jesus. We know how to pray. We don't know what we should pray for sometimes. We just sense something. You've been a parent and woken up and I just feel something's wrong. I just feel something. I don't know what it is. I just feel bad. I just felt bad all day. I don't know why. You know, and we don't know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us. The Spirit will make intercession for us because we don't know how, what to pray for. With groanings, this is the third groaning, with those groanings, uh, which cannot be uttered. Now, literally it wants to say, which cannot be uttered in articulate speech, which cannot be articulated. I can't put it into words. Oh, I can't put that into words. Oh, 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 you know, but it's a groaning on the inside. Oh, I just feel, oh, uh, it's almost like the, the, a woman in, that's the, he, uh, you know, uh, you just she's groaning, right? Because she's about to give birth, and ah, uh, uh, you know, she it's not articulate speech, it's not there's not words coming out. Oh, this is hurting me so much. It's just ah, uh, and we're interpret the spirit he says interprets that groaning, but the spirit in us is talking to God, which cannot be uttered in our or articulated. But now he who searches the hearts, but who's searching the hearts? That's God knows what the mind of the spirit is because if if you can't articulate though if it's just groanings how does god knows what you're saying when you oh oh i just feel so bad uh, uh if the spirit in us is now groaning oh something's happening something's wrong something oh something yeah, oh i don't know what it is 
what's the Spirit saying? It says, he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is. God knows what the Spirit is saying. Because he makes intercession. Who makes intercession? The Spirit in us, the Holy Spirit in us, makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Whatever he's saying is in accordance with what God. They're having a conversation. God and the Spirit in us. Oh, 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 sometimes, oh, I just have to, oh. And we don't, and God knows what that is. God knows what the Spirit in us is saying. So, so Jesus is here groaning in the Spirit. But he's yelling at somebody in the Spirit. Yeah, oh, he's having this, any other time it was used, it was vehemently, yeah, you know, aimed at somebody. But he's saying he's doing, he's groaning in himself. And, and he's troubling himself. Like, this is going on for a little bit. John 11, chapter 34. Just make, uh, okay. And he said, now, now that that's over, he suddenly says, where have you laid him? And they say to him, oh, well, Lord, come and see. And, and then it says Jesus wept. Now, again, Jesus has already told them, I'm going to go raise Lazarus from the dead. First he says, well, he's just sleeping. We go to raise him out of sleep. Well, if he's asleep, let him sleep. Okay, I'm going to raise him from the dead. How did I come up with you disciples? You never know what I'm talking about. What's wrong with you? So let me just tell you playing. I'm going to raise him from the dead. So Jesus is not getting there and going, oh, no. Lazarus is seeing me and start crying. And Jesus has seen death. and seen, Jesus never cried before. Like, why is he? He knows what he's about to raise from the dead. He's not thinking, oh, no. But for some reason, he weeps. And in many of these commentaries, they go, he's weeping because it's just hitting them how final death is. No, it's not final. He's about to raise him from the dead. All these commentaries are trying to figure out what's going on. Why did Jesus suddenly cry? And here's what's interesting. This is not a loud. All they're seeing is tears streaming from him. He's groaned. He's, he's grown. He's made this, all these sounds. Now these tears are streaming from Jesus, but it's not out loud. It's a, this, is, this is just a silent crying. Like times when it, he weeps out loud, they use a different word. For example, in Luke chapter 19, verse 41, it says, Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept. And this is out loud. This is a type of weeping that the wailing women were doing. This out loud weeping. He's, he, he's seeing Jerusalem. He, this is, and this actually happens after he left Lazarus. He's now about to go in, this, in the next week or so. He's about to go to Jerusalem for the final time. And as he's approaching Jerusalem, and remember he's in Bethany right outside of Jerusalem, he sees the city, he starts crying out loud. And it says, saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, this is your day, this is the day of the Lord, the things that were made for your peace but now they are hidden from your eyes. Now you'll never see it. You, I gave you all these chances. Because when he comes in the final week, he's just pronouncing judgment. He goes and he curses the fig tree. He, he, he pronounces a curse in the temple. He turns up the table. It's all judgment now. He had spent three and a half years or three and almost a half minus one week years preaching mercy. And now it's only judgment coming out of his mouth. Because now it's time for the day of the Lord is happening now. Right now that these last months he spent in Jerusalem, it's just judgment. So if you had known for the things that make for your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, which happened in 70 AD, 40 years from there. And they'll level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will leave you they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. I was here visiting you with peace and you wouldn't listen. And so now God's going to come. And so he's weeping out loud. That's not the word here where it says Jesus wept. Now, I just want to, so here's what's going on. I, I believe Jesus is fulfilling another prophecy here. And that's what's happening here. Because he's about to pronounce judgment on Jerusalem. The day the Lord has come. Do not forget when he first came to um, Jerusalem, he, he went into the temple and he reads and says, he reads Isaiah 41, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because, is upon me because he's anointed me to preach to the poor and heal the brokenhearted, et cetera, et cetera. 
And then he says, and to proclaim the acceptable year of our Lord, which is Isaiah 61, verse 2. And then he closes the book, and he doesn't read the next sentence, the next sentence, and the day of vengeance. Because it's not time for him to preach the day of vengeance. He stopped reading at the acceptable year of your Lord, because for the next three years, and almost a half, he's going to be preaching the acceptable, like, now is the time of Jubilee. Now is the time for your peace. Now is the time for your, this is your visitation. But then he's going to preach the day of vengeance, and that's all he's preaching the last time. So the day of the Lord is now there, and he's in that time period with Jerusalem. He's right outside of Jerusalem. It's now the, what's called the, the day of the Lord time period where he's now preaching. Judgment is coming on you. I've given you your opportunity. In Joel chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is at hand. So people want to think that this is talking about 2,000 years later or 3,000 years later or whenever it is that Jesus comes in judgment to judge the whole earth. But that's not what it's talking about. It's coming in judgment when he comes to judge Jerusalem. We know this because in that same second chapter of Joel, it says, um, and it shall come to pass afterwards, after these things happen, which I'm skipping the middle, but I'll, get, I'll go back to it. So he proclaimed that it's the day of the Lord. And then these things are going to happen. And then now it says, and now it's come to pass after these things, that I will pour out my spirit in all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. We know this happened in the book of Acts. In fact, Peter got up and said, this is what Joel was talking about. Jesus came and proclaimed the day of the Lord. And then certain things happened. And then now, afterwards, he's pouring out his spirit. So here's that middle part that I left out. It says, blow the trumpet in Zion. Concentrate a, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, get people together, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and the nursing babes, let the bridegroom go out from his chamber, let the bride from her dressing room, like everybody come out. The bridegroom is about to get married, the bride's about to get married, everybody come out, everybody participate. So, 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 just, so that's just what happened. Jesus is standing in front of Lazarus' tomb, and there's crowds of people there who'd all been there because Lazarus and his family is very rich and all they're all there assembled. Jesus is proclaiming the day of the Lord. And then it says, um, then let the priest who minister to the Lord, and that's Jesus, weep. Let them weep between the porch and the altar. And let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Like, show yourself. They shouldn't be saying, I don't see their God. Do some miraculous thing, God. Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and for and piteous people. And he goes on to say all the things that God's going to do, all the good stuff. So declare that the day of the Lord is here. But let the priest come and weep and let them see one big miracle, right? And then afterwards, it shall come to pass. I'll pour out my spirit in all flesh. So... Jesus is about to, he's in that time period where you declare the day of the Lord, but you still do these last miracles so that people can see them. So he's the priest that is weeping between the porch and the altar. He's, he, Jesus starts weeping. He's been groaning in the spirit. He's troubling himself. He's yelling at somebody. I just want you to know, I believe he's yelling at death. Right? He's, he's, he's wrestling in the spirit, groaning, yelling, troubling himself, agitating himself. Then he suddenly weeps, not because he suddenly discovered that Lazarus was dead or he was suddenly, because he knows he's about to come out of the grave. In 30 seconds, he's coming out of that grave. So why is Jesus crying? And then he says something. So the Jews said, oh, see how he loved him. And I understand they don't know what, look how he's crying. Wow, he really loved him. And some others have said, well, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also kept this man from dying? Like, and that's not a nasty thing. It's like they're thinking, this guy opened the man, guys of the blind. I bet he could have kept him from dying had he been there. They're saying the very same things that Mary and Martha said. So why would Jesus be mad at them? You think I can raise him? You think I could have kept him from dying? I'm so mad at you, which is what the commentator said. I mean, why would Jesus be mad at them for saying, this man who opened the eyes of the blind, couldn't he have kept him from dying? That's just a legitimate question. That's what Mary and Martha said. If you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. So they're saying the same things. Then it says, in John eleven thirty eight, 38, then Jesus again groaning at himself. He's angry. You hear this angry groaning. 
And that's why people say, well, he must have been mad that he said that. But he's not talking to them. He says he's groaning in himself. John wants to make sure you know he's not yelling at somebody else like the other three times that this word was used. He was yelling at somebody or the disciples were yelling at some. He's groaning in himself. He's talking to himself. Whatever he's going, whatever conversation is going on in inarticulate speech, it's coming out as groans or grunts or snorts or whatever's going on and tears are happening. It's happening in Jesus. He says, then he came to the tomb. So he's still making these sounds, right? And it was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus, and then Jesus against it. And Jesus says, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench for he's been dead four days. So she wasn't expecting him to come out of the tomb. That's why Jesus kept correcting her saying, I am the current resurrection. I can do anything. Okay. So Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? And they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes. Here's the important part. And said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I thank you that you have heard me. I thank you you heard my prayer. I, I read the commentators and they say, well, clearly Jesus prayed at some point, but John didn't tell us when that happened. And I'm saying he was praying this groaning and this crying and weeping wasn't because he was mad or he's groaning in the spirit. He's weeping in the spirit. Just like like Paul said in the book of Romans chapter 8, the spirit itself makes intercessions for us with groanings. But, but he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the spirit or he's praying the perfect will of God. So, so he says, I thank you that you've heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, I said this, so they would hear that I was praying, because they may not known what would have happened. So I said, Father, I thank you, you've heard me. Now I only say, he says, and you always hear me, I only said it so they would know that I was just praying, that, that what they're about to see came about because of my prayer, and not just, oops, he wasn't really wasn't dead. So, he says, I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who were standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Because I, I want to get the credit for this. They need to know I was just praying, and that's why this thing just happened. Now, when he said these things, he cried with a loud voice. Lazarus, come forth. Not even Lazarus arise from the, now that it's open, come on out. Because, dude, you're in there. I know you're alive. I was just praying, and then I said, okay. Where's he, where's he laid him? <laughs> Show me where he is because the prayer is done. Okay, take the thing out of the tomb. Lazarus, come forth. And when he said these things, he cried with a loud voice. Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Clearly, Lazarus is here right now. They're escorting him to my house. Oh, it's Santa. Oh, cool. Okay, so... It says, he who died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. So I just want to say this about that. Lazarus, and, then, and I'm finished. So Lazarus comes out. He's wrapped in grave clothes. His face is covered with his napkin. In Mark, this really interesting thing happened. In Mark chapter 14, Jesus goes to the Gethsemane, and he's arrested, right? He, he goes with his disciples. The, the, the Romans take him. And it says, now a certain young man followed him, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body. So somebody is following Jesus, who lives in that Bethany area, because don't forget, Garden of Gethsemane, right on the other side is Bethany. So they take him down, and there's a certain path they're taking him on the way to um, Herod's place. And they've got to pass by Bethany, come down this mountain, and then head east. So someone who lived in the area follows Jesus. They, did, they weren't in the Garden of Gethsemane, but when they came down the mountain, this person sees what's going on. They come out of their house. It says a certain young man followed him having a linen cloth thrown around, just this cloth around his naked body. And the young man and the young men, this is the soldiers, laid hold of this guy. They suddenly grabbed him. 
Now, I want you to know they were, they've been looking for Lazarus. That's why they always they don't mention Lazarus' name in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They don't mention this because they're looking for Lazarus. Lazarus is raised from the grave, and this is like big news, and they want to find Lazarus and put him in jail. And so somebody is following Jesus, and Mark won't say his name. But I, I want you to know what happened, but I can't say who it was. But when they see this naked man wrapped in linen, it says they grab him. So he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Now, that's Mark chapter 14. The very next chapter, he uses the same word for linen cloth. But here's how he uses it. So when, talking about Joseph of Arimathea, when he found out from the centurion, he, he granted the body to Joseph of Arimathea. Like, you can take Jesus' body. Then he brought fine linen. And it's the same word that he'd used in the previous chapter. Took him down and wrapped him in the linen. And he laid him in a tomb, which had been hewn out of the rock and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. So they wrapped Jesus in this fine linen. And just in the previous chapter, he'd used the same word. This man was wrapped in linen that you would wrap somebody if you were really wealthy, which Lazarus' family was, in fine linen. So I wonder... If Lazarus, when he came out of the tomb, very surprised. What am I dead? I think I was just dead. I was talking to Abraham. I know I was just dead. And yet here I am. Oh, my. And he lived probably 10, 20, almost 30 more years. Because by the time John wrote this, he, Lazarus had finally passed away the second time. And he was free to say his real name. That's why John put this story in where Matthew, Mark, and Luke couldn't put the story in because they were still looking for Lazarus. Um, I wonder if Lazarus stayed wrapped in that linen cloth because somebody came running out who lived near there wrapped in a linen cloth and the soldiers let me grab that person and, and then the person ran off and I thought Lazarus never took off that linen cloth when he came out the grave it doesn't say that it's Lazarus it could be somebody else but Mark wanted to make sure you know a certain man came out wrapped in grave clothes and to try to protect Jesus, and then they grabbed him and he ran. So, just interesting to me. So, anyway, he said, Lazarus come forth, and he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth, and Jesus said to him, loose him and let him go. So, they, un they unwrap him, and there he is. And uh, I just think this, that this short verse that we teach kids to pray. Learn a verse. And they, Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible, and every child learns to say, Jesus wept, because you have to say a verse at dinner. Everybody say a Bible verse. Jesus wept. But there's more to it. There's more going on. There's more going on. Jesus groaning in the spirit, troubling himself, crying in the spirit. Jesus wept. And then Lazarus comes forth. I just think there was something bigger going on. And sometimes when you feel, oh, I just got to pray. I just got, something's happening. Oh, Jesus, what, oh, you may not be able to articulate what it is, but the Holy Spirit may still be communicating to God through you, through you. And those of you who are speaking in tongues, etc., you know what I'm talking about, even in, in a deeper, in a deeper way. But all of us may have had that experience and you may start crying, I don't know why I'm crying, or I don't know what, uh, and that could be the Holy Spirit working through you because some situation's going on. There's somebody wrapped up who needs to come out of whatever tomb they're in. And that prayer, that intercession that you're making, that crying you may be doing, may be affecting a situation that you don't, and you don't even know. It says, we don't even know how to pray, the Holy Spirit knows. So we don't even have to know sometimes. I don't know why I'm crying, I don't know why I'm upset. Oh, but I just, but maybe God is working through us. Jesus wept, Jesus groaned, Elijah came out of the tomb, so you, you never know. Okay, we will go on from there uh, with what happened with Lazarus next week and this on sundays i'm in book of exodus um uh and you just didn't know that that bible verse jesus web could be so interesting or somebody could try to make it interesting <laughs> maybe i didn't even make it interesting all right thank you so much again for tuning and for tuning in because i think i'm in the 60s and i will see you uh oh i'm in my 60s and i'm still in the 1960s and uh, i will see you uh next week all right, bye-bye.